Okay. All righty. Good evening. Uh, well, well, good afternoon. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very tired. I've mixed up my time today. But <laughs> thank you for coming to the um, Humanities Center Brown Bag Colloquium. As you have noticed, Dr. Edwards is not here today, and he had an emergency. So graciously, I, I kind of around <laughs> Dr. Interi, but she has decided she has decided and agreed graciously to come in and to do the introduction for Dr. Johnson. And I'd like to thank her and please give her a round of applause because she didn't have to come in today at all. She came especially for this. <laughs> well thank you so much for stepping in. Um I don't think I deserve an applause but <laughs> You know, welcome everybody. And, uh, it's it's kind of odd feeling to be here today, and um, not see a lot of sessions without Dr. Whitmore, Dr. Edwards. You know, I have been part of this for so, for so many years. For so many years, you didn't hear me. You can hear me. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll try to you know pitch my voice. Yeah. I said it's a it's an odd feeling to be here today uh, without Dr. Edwards. Because as many years as I've been part of this, and also um, Dr. Johnson, you know, he is like a fixture in this room. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate that he's not here. But yesterday, at the same time, I was um, attending, at the same time I was attending a conference at the student con um, center. And um, we were talking about integrative uh, biosciences, and um, the speaker was um, um, what's his name now, Dr. Stephen Lanier, who is the vice president for research. Well, I didn't know anything about this IBIO, IBIO, and so it was a very enlightening and engaging lecture to learn something about that beautiful building that you see on Woodward Avenue as you go in north. Um, north of, I think, Antoinette. As you go in north of there, you will find um, this building with uh, brown um, trellis right on the front. Um, I don't know if many, many of you have noticed it, but didn't know what it was. And so it was great to hear how the Humanities Center um, featured in this whole structure of iBio. So for me, it was very good. And whilst I was there, um, Jennifer. Cornered me. Yes, actually, yes, she yes, actually yes. cornered me and asked me to um, to see if I can do the wonderful introduction of my chair. Uh, all it happens to be my chair. Excuse me, I forgot to say my name, but she did say it. my name is um, Professor Daphne Intiri. I'm in the Department of African American Studies, and our gracious and uh, um, illustrious <coughs> chair, um, Professor Ollie Johnson. Well, Ollie is no stranger to the Humanities Center. He's been here for quite some time, and uh, I'll just, just take a few minutes to um, say something about him. Um, he is chair and associate professor in the Department of African American Studies at Wayne State University. He graduated from Brown University with a B in Afro-American Studies and International Relations. He also graduated from Brown with a MA in Brazilian Studies in 1986. Professor Johnson graduated from the University of California at Berkeley with a master's in political science and a PhD in political science in 1993. So he came to Wayne in 2004, and he has worked or offered um, a lot of um, um, sessions, um, present presentations with the Humanities Center. In fact, he was a resident scholar during the academic years 2007, 2008, and then 2008 and 2009 with the Humanities Center. So he actually is no stranger to the Humanities Center. In 2007, he was selected for the faculty fellowship. The title of that paper then was Affirmative Action and Racial Justice in Brazil. I'm not going to read all this stuff, but just wanted to make you aware that he's going to be presenting with Melba Boyd on the theme Civility and Incivility that's going to be offered by the Humanities Center a little later in the term. I think it's Friday, October 13th, so make sure you put that on your calendar so you can hear him again. Um, uh, two, uh, 2008 to 2011, Professor Johnson gave 14 invited lectures, paper presentations in the United States and abroad. He has um, 
2009, he lectured at the University of California at Berkeley, University of Notre Dame, and in 2008, using Skype, he gave a lecture on the American presidential election to a Brazilian audience at the Centro Universitario Estadual da Zona Oeste <laughs> in Rio de Janeiro from his desk here at Wayne State University. So, uh, Professor Johnson is currently preparing an edited volume for publication, The Rutledge Handbook of Afro-Latin American Politics. His current research focuses on African-American, Afro-Brazilian, and Afro-Latin American politics. He's the co-editor of two books, Race, Politics, and Education in Brazil, Affirmative Action in Higher Education, that was published in 2015, and Black Political Organizations in the Post-Civil Rights Era in 2002. <laughs> He authored Brazilian Party Politics at the Coup of 1964 and co-edited Black, Black Political Organizations in the Post-Civil Rights Era in 2001. His lecture today is entitled New Perspectives on Afro-Latin American Politics. So please, will you join me in giving him a warm welcome? I guess we'll do 40 minutes and then questions. And what's the time? Half an hour. Yeah. Half an hour. Okay. Thank you so much for attending this brown bag talk. I really am a big fan of the Humanity Center. I appreciate the good work that Jennifer does. That. The director Walter Edwards does, and so it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. I am excited, I'm hyped up, because as co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Afro-Latin American Politics, I get to read a lot of chapters of scholars doing cutting-edge research on all the countries and all the readings. Uh, or all the regions uh, within Latin America. And so I'm learning a lot, and uh, I'm going to combine some of that new knowledge with my own research to talk today uh, about Cuba and Brazil in particular. And I hope in the Q&A we uh, can raise other questions about other countries as well. Cuba is at a very delicate moment right now, obviously because of the hurricane and because of the weather. Um, obviously the Caribbean nations are regularly battered and challenged by um, hurricanes and storms and flooding, etc. But Cuba has a reputation of responding very well, very effectively and efficiently to these uh, types of disasters. Uh, because even though housing could be devastated and some infrastructure, Cuba uh, has a good record in terms of organization, response, and minimizing the loss of life. And uh, Cubans take great pride in this. The Cuban government takes great pride in this. And so I want to begin my comments talking about uh, the Cuban Revolution, 1959. The Cuban Revolution triumphed Fidel Castro, led by Fidel Castro and his brother Raul Castro and the other revolutionaries. And that revolution, including some of those revolutionaries, are in power now. So the revolution has endured despite numerous attempts by the United States government to overthrow the revolution, despite efforts by uh, Cuban 
exiles and counter-revolutionaries to overthrow the revolution, the revolution has been able to meet every challenge, even when the world came to the brink of nuclear war, when the Soviet Union, United States uh, battled over the installation of rockets or missiles uh, in Cuba. And so, one of the most important things that we need to understand about the Cuban Revolution is that it is egalitarian. From the beginning, it made a commitment, public, explicit, to structural transformation in the Cuban economy, society, politics, and culture. And some of the classic examples of those policies were uh, agrarian reform, breaking up the uh, large land holdings and breaking the power of the rural elite, uh, the literacy campaign. Cuba, in a national mobilization, set people, especially young people, all over the island to teach um, adults how to read and write. Cuba abolished the political parties of the time who were which were corrupt and uh, complicit with previous military and authoritarian rule. And so it also committed itself to uh, providing a job or guaranteed income to all Cubans. It also committed itself to free education from kindergarten through the university. And it also committed itself to free health care, universal health care. And so the result of these commitments was dramatic and positive. So that by the end of the 1960s, a decade in, Cuba was one of the most egalitarian countries uh, on earth. Poverty, be, poverty had been uh, minimized. And throughout the 70s and 80s as well, Cuba uh, had a very impressive record in terms of health indicators, uh, quality of life indicators uh, for its population. And I say all this to say, Afro-Cubans benefited dramatically from the revolution in terms of health care, in terms of education, in terms of some of the standard indicators that we think of. The Cuban Revolution was much less successful in terms of creating uh, political openness or democratic space for different forces. In fact, because of internal and external threats, the Cuban Revolution uh, created a one-party system. One party uh, is in power in Cuba today, has been in power for most of the time of the revolution. And even though other political parties exist in Cuba, they're not really recognized 
they can't really run for office. And so uh, there are severe limits in terms of political activity in Cuba. And so I wanted to raise the question uh, for you that scholars have raised. What has been the impact of the Cuban Revolution on Afro-Cubans, uh, blacks and mulattoes? Because Cuba, like most countries in Latin America, uh, recognizes an intermediate category, uh, mulatto, mestizo, and other terms, in a way that we really don't recognize officially in the United States, even though there are is increasing movement to recognize biracial identity, multiracial identity, but that's common in, in Latin America. Uh, I mean, common in the United States. Uh, <coughs> I lost my train of thought. It's common in the United States to combine uh, people who would be considered mulattoes or morenos or mestizos with dark-skinned folks as one people. Uh, it's often referred to as a one-drop rule. And in uh, Latin America, much less. Uh, first scholar to write kind of comprehensively on the Cuban Revolution from a black perspective was Carlos Moore. He was hypercritical of the Cuban Revolution. He's an Afro-Cuban himself. He argued that the price of all the egalitarian social and public policy of the Cuban Revolution was too high, and that the Cuban Revolution was fundamentally racist and white supremacist. Why? Because it banned black social clubs. It shut down uh, Afro-Cuban uh, civil rights groups and other institutions that existed before the revolution. And so it severely contracted the political space of blacks in Cuba in the name of socialism, and it combined that with a belief in the ideology of racial democracy. The idea that in Latin America there's a special type of harmonious relations among different racial and ethnic groups in which a large mixed population is recognized and that conflicts tend to be resolved more uh, nonviolently than in countries like the United States and South Africa that have experienced a type of brutal segregation and division by color. Carlos Moore was giving speeches and writing articles in the 60s and 70s and wrote a very important book in the 1980s offering this devastating critique of the Cuban Revolution. Now, Scholars and activists in the Cuban government have responded say, no, 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 he's wrong, he's exaggerated. And some of the new research on Cuba takes a more nuanced approach, recognizing the positive gains that Afro-Cubans have made in terms of standard of living, health care, education, etc., and Acknowledging that the regime is not a multi-party regime. It's not, um, Cubans are free to organize and speak um, because of the security concerns of the government. Now, recently and under very difficult circumstances, 
scholars from Cuba and the United States have been conducting survey research, ethnographic research, personal interviews within Cuba on the question of race, including among the black population. As a matter of fact, I want to call attention to a new book by a friend of mine, which is entitled The Power of Race in Cuba, Racial Ideology and Black Consciousness During the Revolution by Danielle Cleaver. This is a very important book, 2017, Oxford University Press. And she argues that racism is alive and well in Cuba and that if Afro-Cubans were allowed to organize, they would likely organize, which is to say, despite the reality that nationalism is strong in Cuba, there's a strong sense of Cuban identity, and that the idea of racial Democracy is strong in Cuba. There are still parts of the Afro-Cuban population that feels and recognizes the importance of black social organization, of black political organization. And she argues that her research suggests that if they were allowed to uh, create those spaces they would and um, at the mass level right now in Cuba there are uh, art, black artists activists intellectuals government officials who are trying to convince the government to be more um, aware of ongoing racial discrimination. The um, <coughs> cells argue that there has been a resurgence of racial discrimination in Cuba as a result of the uh, demise of the Soviet Union, the demise of Eastern European communist countries that had strong economic relations with Cuba. And so now, Cuba is heavily dependent on two relatively new sources of income, tourism and remittances from Cubans abroad. Most of the Cubans abroad who can send remittances are white Cubans, and that money tends to go to white Cubans in Cuba. The tourism sector which has grown dramatically uh, in the last 15 to 20 years also has tended to be led by uh, white Cuban government officials partnering with uh, European and Canadian firms and <coughs> Afro-Cubans have complained bitterly and increasingly openly about their lack of equal opportunity within this growing tourist industry. And so uh, black activists in Cuba say, are telling the government you need to deal with this. This is serious. Uh, this isn't us. What happened to, there is no racism in Cuba. What happened to, we're all equal. And so that is where we are now in Cuba, in the sense that racial discrimination is greater than it's been in other periods of the revolution. Afro-Cubans Afro are complaining about it more but the government is still not adequately 
acknowledging the seriousness of the problem and much less proposing measures to deal with the problem. And so some of the measures that activists in Cuba and scholars have recommended are racial affirmative action. Maybe we need to take some measures to make sure that the tourist industry within Cuba is integrated, that you have black supervisors, black managers, and blacks in distributed in all positions that interact with the public. And they're arguing for those policies within uh, the spirit of the revolution. These folks are also arguing that groups uh, should be allowed to protest racism when it occurs. The government should take strong measures against racial discrimination when it occurs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the response has been less than uh, full. And so Fidel Castro, the leader of the revolution, passed away last year. Uh, his brother, the current major leader in Cuba, Raul Castro, has stated that he's going to step down soon. I believe next year, 2018 or 2019. And so that's going to represent a real transition. Will it be an opportunity for the revolution to make some major changes? on the question of race, or will it be an opportunity for the revolution to kind of double down on uh, a racial democracy perspective that minimizes the reality of racism and marginalizes Afro-Cubans who want to organize uh, socially, politically, culturally? Uh, that's an ongoing uh, question. Now I want to turn to Brazil. Brazil is also in crisis right now. I was able to spend six months in Brazil last year, and I was surprised and outraged that while I was there, they began impeachment proceedings against the first female president in Brazil's history, Dilma Rousseff, uh, a member of the Workers' Party, who had already completed one presidential term in office, been elected to a second term, and had a falling out with members of her coalition government. And Long story short, the main coalition government <laughs> decided to abandon her, Joe the President, and the government. The initials of this uh, political party are the PMDB. And they had the speakers, Speaker of the House position, they had the Senate Majority Leader position. And they uh, abandoned the government and worked with the opposition, the conservative opposition, to ensure that Joma was officially impeached. She was removed from office early last year. She was definitively impeached in August of last year. Uh, one of the lead behind the speed, behind the scenes conspirators was her vice president, Michelle Tenemer, a constitutional law professor and lawyer in his own right. And so I 
and many others describe what happened, this impeachment process, as a political coup or a parliamentary coup because I'm not persuaded that Juma did anything to warrant uh, being removed from office uh, and that really she just lost her majority in Congress. Uh, but this is occurring at a time of widespread corruption in which people from the Workers' Party and from all the other leading parties are in prison now on trial or expecting to be uh, or expecting to go on trial. President Lula, former President Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, one of the most popular presidents in Brazilian history who preceded Joe Josefi, he's been indicted and he is appealing, or, or he's been convicted, he's appealing his sentence of nine years in prison. And, uh, but he has other charges against him as well, other corruption charges. So the Workers' Party and progressive forces in Brazil want Lula to one, run for president next year, but he can't run if he's in prison. And I think Unfortunately, he may be prevented from running for office. And I bring Jill and Lula up because under their administrations, the country implemented a number of progressive policies of social inclusion, trying to get kids in the rural area trying to get poor kids to go to school, paying their parents to make sure their kids go to school, make sure they get their vaccinations. Um, the Lula government, the Juma government also strongly supported affirmative action, racial and class affirmative action at the university level in the public sector. And so the past 15 years have been years of dramatic progress from, according to black activists and according to progressives, in the direction of more racial equality, more racial justice, uh, more inclusion of uh, Afro-Brazilians and poor people in uh, jobs and other positions of relevance. All of that, I would argue, is at risk now that Michelle Temer is the president and his coalition, his majority coalition, starts at the center of the political spectrum and then goes to the right. So it's a very conservative reactionary majority governing coalition in Brazil, many of whom have historically worked against affirmative action and a lot of the other social policies of inclusion that have been prominent in the last uh, 15 years. And so I've done a lot of research on uh, black politicians, political representation, and since the end of the military dictatorship, 1985, to the present, over 30 years, there's been slow and steady progress in terms of more black officials, black politicians being elected to office, more public policies at uh, the local, state, and national level being implemented, uh, trying to be more inclusive, condemning racial discrimination. Uh, I don't think any black activists have been satisfied with what has transpired, but there has been a sense that progress has been made, was being made, 
and that this represents a kind of moment of danger. Uh, and I agree with that assessment, basically. And I want to call your attention to a new development, which is very interesting to me, and I still don't understand it uh, fully, but it's the rise of the black conservative in Brazil. Right now, in the last couple election cycles, uh, a number or a few prominent black conservatives, often evangelical Christians, have been elected to public office on a platform that con includes condemning all of the policies that the traditional progressive black movement has advocated, whether it being uh, anti-discrimination laws, uh, pro-affirmative action policies, the teaching of Afro-Brazilian history and culture in public schools. Uh, these black conservatives have condemned those policies as racist. And they've argued that the black community doesn't need any special policies, doesn't need the crumbs of the federal government to um, improve its position in society. What does it mean? Faith in God. Faith in Jesus. In the church. And these uh, activists black conservative activists who have been recently elected in office are often grassroots politicians. They are often from the poorest areas. They often have churches in the poorest areas and they often do work in the poorest areas in terms of uh, teaching classes, providing services and assistance to the poor, and uh, in the context of doing their religious outreach. And so it seems to me that, ironically, they and other conservatives have learned the lessons of the Workers' Party. Uh, because remember, again, the party of Lula, the party of Jilma, it started off in the early 80s as a real grassroots party. They were in the labor union strong. They were in the community strong. They were in the religious community strong. They just had a presence in terms of doing grassroots organizing. And now it seems that they may have been uh, spoiled by power, spoiled by kind of years in office and kind of a loss of sense of their roots. And uh, as a result, lost their popularity and have failed to create a kind of second generation of popular politicians who could replace Luisa Gansi Lula da Silva as a presidential candidate next year. There don't seem to be a lot of uh, obvious alternatives to Lula in the Workers' Party or on the political left in general. And so I I'm very worried about the situation in Brazil. I'm very worried about the situation in Cuba regarding uh, the question of black politics and uh, moving in a progressive direction. I uh, think we need to do a lot more research to get a sense of kind of where we are in terms of racial politics and black politics in Latin America and where we're going in the future. I want to stop because I want your comments and questions, but I thank you for coming and appreciate you. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Yes. I just have, I guess, it applies to both populations. I'm not, um, well versed 
as you are. Definitely not as much as you are. But in terms of percentages of Afro Latin peoples in Cuba versus, or even in um, Brazil, Brazil, is it known how many? Like, what's the representation of the total population? Is it half, twenty-five percent? Uh, how? What's the makeup of these? Officially, in Cuba, officially, most recent racial census says that they're about uh, ten percent blacks in Cuba, about thirty-five percent, uh, or about twenty-five percent uh, mulattoes. Mestizos, and I guess sixty percent white Cubans. Very few scholars take those numbers seriously because over the last decades of the revolution, most of the folks leaving Cuba have been white Cubans. Right. So you would suggest, and if you just walk around Cuba. Uh, I was able to take a study abroad class in Cuba in 2000. And other scholars have been in Cuba from the United States recently. And it just looks like the, the black and uh, mixed population, the Afro-Cuban population, is higher than 35%. It's, it just seems the visual test. Mm -hmm. But the government doesn't want to talk about that. The government doesn't want to talk about demographics. Yes. This is it's, it's, I want you to finish the one on Brazil, but this is kind of like a follow-up because it's like, I know that they have, the U.S. Census here, for example, splits like the, the Hispanic population, white Hispanic, black Hispanic, and some people find it more favorable to become similar into whiteness. So the reality is um, some people may just check that box versus actually how they pretend potentially look. Does that make sense? And maybe, if you, as you're saying, the discrimination occurs in Cuba, maybe people feel more favored to check the white. Well, no, 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 no. My understanding <coughs> is that the census, the census taker checks the box in Cuba. Ah. Unlike the United States where we fill it out in, okay. in Brazil where the individual person uh, fills out the census. Okay. And so, um, yeah, I think uh, most scholars feel that the Afro-Cuban percentage of the population is a majority of the population, uh, but officially it's 35 percent. And um, but again, not a lot of people do research on this, but people have commented on it. If you look at the Cuban leadership, uh, political bureau, uh, ministers of state top government officials, that is probably more than 60% white. And so you, you kind of see a, a contrast between the population in terms of demographics, of demographics racial makeup, and the political leadership, hmm. much whiter. But, but are all the whites who, white Cuba, Cubans who came to the United States, would they be white according to an American definition? No, but I think... Um, they would be Latino or Hispanic. Yeah, I know, but uh, I mean, even in, among the Southern segregationists, they've been doing DNA studies, and it turns out that they're not quite as white as they say they are. Right. And so it seems to me that probably something like that is even more true in Brazil and in Cuba, where people sort of become white as they go up. Right. I think there is in social class there and in wealth. Is something going on there in terms of the race class connection? Um, and we have to remember that um, the United States um, has had a tremendous impact on Cuba. It intervened in Cuba and occupied Cuba. It still has a military base in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And so the United States, there was already racism in Cuba. But when the United States intervened 100 years plus ago, it also brought American-style racism and Jim Crow to Cuba. Okay. And so um, that was one of the main triumphs of the revolution, 59 and the 60s, was to dismantle all the segregated facilities in Cuba that were racially segregated. Uh, swimming pools, clubs, businesses, etc. Um, and so that was one of the measures that endeared 
Afro-Cubans to the uh, Cuban Revolution. And now just to finish up with Brazil, uh, blacks in Brazil about 8%. Uh, browns or pardos are about 43, 44%. So that's why uh, scholars and government officials say that you can say that Brazil's a majority uh, black or Afro-Brazilian uh, country in terms of population. Uh, but again, if you look at the political elite, as I've done in my work, and as if you look at the business class, as other scholars have done, overwhelmingly white. It's over the elite across the board in Brazil, as many countries in Latin America, the Americas tend to be uh, whiter and lighter than the uh, masses. And a lot of activists comment on that, that that's a problem, that lack of uh, representation and correspondent distribution. Um, but let me just say, uh, racial statistics are very tricky in general, in Latin America in particular, because for many years, and I would still argue today, uh, blackness often has negative connotations and are associated with ugliness, uh, stupidness, uh, dishonesty, just a lot of negative connotations. And so people who are in that mixed category uh, might lighten themselves up to distance themselves from that negative uh, implication. Now we're experiencing the opposite problem because blackness has its benefits in terms of affirmative action because uh, the best universities in Brazil tend to be public universities, state and federal universities, and their spots are very competitive. You know, to gain admissions to a state university or public university, you know, students often study a whole year to take the uh, entrance exam. It's a high state entrance exam. But once they're accepted, it's basically free higher education. They just have a few fees. Um, and it's unfortunately been the traditional reserve of the white middle class and the white elite. But with affirmative action, students who graduate from public high schools, which tend to be uh, the schools where the working class and poor go, they've been guaranteed seats. And so people usually describe that as class affirmative action. And kind of within that class affirmative action, uh, you have racial affirmative action, in which 50% or 40% of the students uh, should represent the racial makeup of the state. And so that has led to more seats and more opportunities for blacks and browns and working class students in universities. And so the question is, if someone's a mixed race ancestry in Brazil, but on the light end and always considered um, himself white, but knows or heard that he had a black grandmother or black grandfather, should the student invoke that African ancestry to be able to apply for the university position. And a lot of students have done that. And so a lot of advocates of the firm have said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what we had in mind. We didn't have super light-skinned uh, Afro-Brazilians who recently found or recently embraced their African ancestry applying, getting these positions um, and so they called them the um, Afro-convenient students. <laughs> students who have uh, conveniently and recently kind of embraced their African heritage and answer. Any other questions, comments? Yes, please. I, um, I have a question. I'm, I'm curious about the case of Cuba. But I was wondering if, if some of these recent scholars who've been looking into the issue uh, uh, have talked a bit more about what specific policy 
changes, these younger activists or, or you know, more recent uh, activists are asking for in the case of Cuba. And, and the reason I ask that is I'm, I'm, the flip side is how are they diagnosing the problem? Where do they see the problem to be? Because the interesting case of Cuba, and you did such a great job at the beginning of your talk, uh, highlighting how much Cuba got right, how much the revolution, in fact, opened the doors to, to a lot of opportunities, uh, universities, uh, and all that. And still, we have this problem today. So uh, it's part of the issue that uh, those policies were never really enacted as broadly as we think they were, or is part of the problem that, yeah, they were enacted, but racism migrated to other areas of society. I mean, you may get your diploma, but you may still not be employed because of your race or something like that. I don't know if I'm making sense. Thank you for the question. Yes, yeah. you are. That's a very important question. And I am sympathetic to the view that the Cuban Revolution did get a lot of right, but it made a fundamental error. At the beginning, while it was doing, while it was outlawing segregation, outlawing racial discrimination, emphasizing equality and an egalitarian uh, ethos, as Cuban, as distinctively Cuban, as distinctively socialist, it prevented a wide, island-wide discussion, debate on racism, on the racial history of the country. And so black activists at the time, the early 60s, that these positive policies were being implemented, um, they would say, you know, we've got to follow this up with discussion of the different dimensions of racism, the complexity of racism, our 400-year our history. I mean, these laws and policies aren't going to get rid of the 400 years. We've got to deal with that. And the, from the top leadership, Fidel Rowe, they said, no, racism is over. We, we're not talking about that anymore. It's not an issue anymore. And if you keep on bringing it up, you're going to get in trouble. And so the activists were all like, wait a minute. This is, in the, this is an indication that we do need to talk about it. But they were unsuccessful in that struggle. And so their argument is that a lot of that um, historical cultural racism remained within Cuban society despite the progress being made and that when it hit the, the special period, the period of severe economic crisis, Cuba was basically in depression, beyond depression during much of the 90s. And you know, sources got scarce, more competition, less cooperation, that racism reemerged. And friends, colleagues, neighbors, fellow students started saying things and doing things that their Afro-Cuban colleagues were surprised and disappointed about. And so I agree with the scholars from Carlos Moore, uh, Mark Sawyer, Daniel Cleland that at that early period, the, uh, the revolution should have supplemented his progressive public policies with um, an explicit educational campaign uh, to discuss what is racism, what uh, uh, can we do about it. What they did was conceptualize racism as an individual uh, problem of prejudice and not an institutional problem, not a structural problem, but an institutional, but an attitudinal, personal problem. And they said, we, we solved all the structural, you know, by declaring segregation illegal, by declaring racial discrimination illegal, we've solved that. And, you know, if somebody's prejudiced, you know, how can we change the heart of somebody? And so that was inadequate. But in terms of what um, activists, black activists, are advocating now, I think, uh, in, in some cases, they're, they're arguing for proportional representation. Okay, they say, you know, you're saying we're 35% of the population. We know we're more than 35% of the population, but even if we're 35% of the population, we're not 35% of the managers in the hotels, in the tourist sector. 
We're not 35% of the supervisors in positions of visibility and influence. And so we need to deal with that. And so in some regards, they're, they're advocating a kind of racial affirmative action um, in the spirit of the revolution, kind of saying this is, we should be about this uh, because it's fair, it's decent, uh, and everybody should have access to new opportunities that have emerged with um, the tourism industry being, being the major one. I think we can take one more question. Sorry, we're running out of time. Yes. I was thinking as you were talking about the connection between um, inequality, as you described it, and economic progress. One of the things that you mentioned was that the Cuban Revolution broke up the big uh, farms. The big, yes. uh, and, but then at the end you also say that now Cuba is relying very, very heavily on remittances and tourism. That's, that's two sources of income that are not all that reliable and are not all that democratic, so to speak, which you also mentioned. Yes. That that you know the the tourism jobs are going mostly to the to the lighter skinned people and the remittances are mostly going to the lighter skinned people and the other people are being left behind economically also and I'm wondering about the the efforts that that a Cuban uh, government made while they were making it more egalitarian in education in health and in other ways made to create more wealth that would make it easier for people to sort of swallow all that all that egalitarianism and it, it seems to me that i know that cuba was under tremendous pressure there, there was an embargo from the united states there was uh, not much help from the rest of latin america although a number of people then event, a number of countries eventually broke away from the embargo and did establish relations with Cuba. Cuba. The Soviet Union wasn't a big help. They were having their own problems, and they were having their own problems with breaking up their, their uh, agricultural uh, holdings. So I'm, I'm just wondering about how all that sort of integrates into a, a wide uh, panorama, or how the racial relations fit into a wider economic panorama in Cuba from the revolution on. I know that this is uh, the subject of three or four books <laughs> that you might want to write or not, but <laughs> do you have any, any, anything to, I mean, do you have anything, does anything jump up at you? Yes, I think, well, the books have already been written. Scholars right. have argued that Cuba has, was not, the Cuban revolution was not successful in creating a prosperous society. It was successful in creating a much more egalitarian right, society, right. but a prosperous society in which economic growth was uh, apparent, it was not, uh, it, it remained relatively dependent on sugar as their main uh, mm -hmm. export. Tobacco? Right, the, the traditional sources. Right. And so. Um, Smoke and booze. When, and then, so that's why they, out of desperation, during the 1990s, returned to tourism, which had been big before the revolution, and they were the leading critics of the negative consequence or negative uh, related activities that come with prostitution, uh, with tourism, prostitution being one of the mm -hmm. most in, uh, obvious opportunities for organized crime to gain a foothold and opportunities for corruption and so they have recreated a new tourism sector after spending decades criticizing the old one and so my question is will uh, Cuba follow the Chinese example or the Vietnamese example of maintaining a one-party social system or one-party communist system but trying to open up the economy, trying to diversify the economy, trying to bring uh, foreign investment in to stimulate the economy. Um, and Cuba has moved in that direction very cautiously, very slowly. Mm -hmm. And 
Uh, people say the government is afraid. The government doesn't want to lose control. But uh, the problem is Cuba has one of the most highly educated populations in the world. They're increasingly gaining uh, access to the internet. They have family and friends in Miami, and so they see, you know, the glitz and glamour and seduction of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that has an impact. I didn't mention, but let me just throw out also that uh, music is a big part of Cuban culture, mm -hmm. and rap music in particular has been a way for um, black youth and brown youth and poor youth to express their frustrations and criticize the government. Actually, Brazil, too. Yes. Yes, very much so. I, I was kind of curious in a way because I remember when Obama came and made official relations with Cuba and all that sort of thing, the, I, my understanding was there were foreign corporations in Cuba for a long time. They are making a lot of money. We finally, although our American corporations were in their, through their subsidiaries, they're Canadian or whatever, and we officially opened up relations. What effect did that have in Cuba, and, 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 and what will Donald Trump's closing of the door of Cuba do now that this other thing is happening? My understanding is that American corporations were not able to go into Cuba in any serious way and it really was, when Cuba opened up, it was really was much more European influence and, uh, again, Canadian, and that Obama wanted to uh, enable American business to uh, have a real presence in Cuba. I think the Cubans are receptive to that, even though they're permanently suspicious of the, of the United States. Uh, so, but, but I don't think it's, and you know, they're, Often, you know, conservative members of Congress who want this, they, they want free enterprise, they want um, U.S. foreign investment. But I don't, I don't think there's a big presence, American presence, in Cuba right now, private sector, and um, and I don't, I think there's not a lot of potential with Trump threatening to close down the opportunities that do exist. So I'm not optimistic on that front. I just thought that like a lot of those Canadian companies that were really owned by Americans or their subs that were in Canada, they were going into Cuba and they were spending and they were investing there in, in Cuba. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that in terms of the American connection of the international corporations. Uh, I, really, I really can't speak to that. But you can say that you say that you think Trump is not going to be able to do what he's claiming. I think Trump may be successful in kind of closing down the opening and the, the parts of the reestablishment of relations that occurred under the uh, end of the Obama administration. Okay, so please join me in thanking um, Professor Johnson for this. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank you.